You are now listening to Imprint with Nesreen on Yahella Voice. She is beautiful and classy, but her intelligence surpasses everything superficial. She's an attorney and practices law since the year of 2003 and has her own firm in Chicago. She is listed as an attorney that changed the law after a high-profile case against Drew Peterson. This woman was featured in two books, I Speak for Myself and Drew Peterson Exposed. Her inspiration goes beyond being attorney. She is also an Arab-American advocate for women, children, and individuals in need. She offers aggressive and professional legal representation and counsel in various areas of law. She has gone through many trials and tribulations that the average person wouldn't fathom going through being raised in a traditional household. Rim Oda, it's a pleasure to have you on the show Imprint on Yahela Voice. Thank you for having me, Nisreen. Reem, you were born in Virginia. Yes. In a traditional Arab household. But you had a culture clash. Tell us about that. Well, I was born in Virginia by parents that immigrated here. My grandfather actually had come to the United States before my parents. And I had one of my great-grandfathers who actually came to the United States. So I would say we'd been, we've been here since the late 1800s, early 19, 1900s. Mm-hmm. So my family was very concerned about raising us in a traditional Islamic Middle Eastern um, household. So that, you know, obviously that didn't, you know, blend in well with the American culture, especially growing up and going to high school and some of the activities that they had when you were going to school did not really um, conform to the way that we were raised. So there was a lot of, I mean, that's a, that's a huge topic and it's, uh, so how did you find easy. balance with that? I don't know if you ever really find balance <laughs> until you get older mm-hmm. and then you learn to appreciate it. But at some point it all ends up working out and you find a way to, to bridge the gap. You find uh, a way to be able to pick and choose uh, what you think works for you. So it's all, I think, based on an individual basis. I mean, what works for one household or one child or one individual, you know, might be okay and it might not be for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the inspiration of being an attorney and a little bit about your academic career. Sure. Well, I finished high school in Florida. I graduated from St. Xavier University with my psychology and I also did have a minor in communications. I ended up um, taking the LSAT right after college. I worked also for a large insurance brokerage firm at the same time that I was going to law school. So I I did um, end up taking the LSAT, which is the entrance exam to get into law school. I was successful with that. I applied to a few schools, and then I finally decided to go to John Marshall to get my Juris Doctor degree. And how was law school? Actually, law school was one of the best times of my life. I really thought it to be very, um, you know, it was a lot of hard work, and it went by really fast. You have to be very dedicated and uh, very organized, and also it's very challenging. A lot of people don't really say that law school is great. I mean, when I speak with people that are in law school, they say that's the worst time. So it's actually a surprise that you're saying you're excited about it. Sure. Actually, the the first year, there are a lot of struggles, and it is very challenging. After you are able to overcome the first year of law school, then, you know, the second and the third year of law school become a lot more, a lot easier. So I think that if you ask somebody out of their first year, they'll probably tell you a different uh, perspective from when they first started. Mm -hmm. And after you graduated, Mm -hmm. I know that you worked in different offices as an attorney. What different areas of law did you, or are you still practicing? Sure. During law school, I actually clerked, and clerking is the position that you actually work in while you are studying law. So I worked as a law clerk for a large firm, and I was trained on handling cases representing the state of Illinois. I was working in an area of law called eminent domain and condemnation cases. So I actually represented the state of Illinois in handling those matters, and that was under the direction of the uh, Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. I also clerked for the 
public defender's office, I wanted to get a feel for both civil litigation as well as the criminal field to see which one I felt that I was more comfortable handling and which area of the law I actually enjoyed the most. Now you have an array of fields of law that you actually practice. Which one really stands out at you? I'm not sure if I actually have one that I think I prefer over the other. I think criminal law is very interesting. I enjoy working with the variety of constitutional issues. I enjoy working around law enforcement and I do enjoy, I think it's a, a, factually, I think criminal law is a lot more fascinating. Immigration law is a big area of law that I handle. I think that that is so broad mm -hmm. and very challenging. So I do enjoy both of those areas of the law. We do in my firm handle immigration, criminal, we do family law. We have a section in our, in our firm that handles personal injury, work, workman's compensation, which is pretty much civil litigation. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what you feel comfortable with. And for me, like I said, I think the issues that affect individual families, such as the criminal law, family law, immigration law, those are the ones that I think cl hit close to home and that I feel come naturally to me. When you say hit close to home, could you elaborate on that? Well, you know, I mean, for example, immigration law, I mean, I can relate to family members immigrating to the United States. I can relate to civil liberties that uh, may be violated because one may not be a U.S. citizen or not mm -hmm. here a permanent resident, or to individuals that are seeking to start a new life and escape you know, tragedies or escape places that have wars going on. So I'm able to help them with you know political asylum, mm -hmm. refugees. So that's actually something that I think I really do enjoy and it's very fulfilling it just I think it's more rewarding to me than any amount of money when you can actually help a family start a new life and um, overcome some of these tragedies that they've already had to experience and endure so I really do think that that's something I enjoy family law you know I have children of my own and I've, I've also been through divorce so I think that I can add a little bit more value just because of the fact that I've been through that, I can relate to the families and some of the trials and triumphs, the mm -hmm. the you know trials that they go through. So I think that, based on you know my experience, my own personal experience, I think that that helps a lot. And you are also involved in many organizations, organizations such as the American Bar Association, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the just to name a few, the Arab American Bar Association. So tell us about that. Tell us more about what those organizations actually stand for and why you're a part of them. Well, when you become licensed as an attorney, then you have an obligation to fulfill some of your you know duties to society, and some of this means that you should be active. Aside from just your job, you know, you should be active in the community. And in order to get to help people um, outside of the scope of your employment or your job, you know, it's good to be involved in organizations. So, for example, the American Immigration Lawyers Association helps me to be on top of some of the new laws that come out um, constantly, things that are changing helps me network with other attorneys throughout the country. So if my client is detained or somebody has a problem in another state, at least being part of this organization helps me to network and find an attorney that I've met through the organization for uh, my client. For, um, we also have the Arab American mm -hmm. Bar Association I've been involved in, and uh, we have. I'm also part of the Cook County advisory board for Tom Dart, and this is uh, one of the meetings that I had last night where we addressed Superintendent McCarthy and we brought issues uh, to him regarding the Muslim community in Cook County in Chicago and uh, some of the issues that we see are affecting the community that are not being addressed by the police department. So mm -hmm. this is a way, another venue for us to be able to reach out to law enforcement or city official, another way to just help, you know, to How important bridge is the gap. it for you to do that? 
How important is it for you to be a Muslim advocate or an Arab American advocate? Well, I think it's very important. I think that it's important for, for on many levels. Um, a lot of our uh, people in our community are either afraid to ask the questions, have their civil liberties being violated, and they don't know where to go or how to find help or where to seek assistance for you know some of the issues that are affecting them. So I think that being part of these organizations and advocating on their behalf and being a voice for people that otherwise could not speak on their own behalf is very important. And especially after 9-11, many people don't really know what they can do legally or what they can fight for. Yes. So why don't you talk to us Sure. About it's that? not only that they don't know, but I think a lot of people are afraid. Um, they are just afraid of law enforcement in general. Mm -hmm. They don't know what their rights are or they have information that they're getting from sources that are giving them information that, that is incorrect. Uh, after 9-11, obviously our community has been through so much and the backlash I think still continues. I believe that had we not had these organizations in place and people advocating on behalf of the community that the backlash would have been a lot worse. I think we've made so much progress as a result. We are able as a community now to be represented through these organizations and meet with these officials and they are able to hear our voices and we can address them directly one-on-one. -on -one. So I think it makes a big difference. It helps a lot. Reem, next I'm going to speak to you about your feature in I Speak for Myself. Uh, once more, you're listening to Imprint on Yehla Voice on our main website, www.yehlavoice.com. Make sure that if you have any comments or questions, you could text us to 708-321-1313 or drop us a line on our Facebook page, Yehla Voice. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back on the show, Imprints on Yehla Voice, with an exclusive interview with attorney Reem Oda. I speak for myself. This book is a compilation of articles written by American Muslim women under the age of 40. And they were born and raised in America as well. You wrote a short chapter titled Dual Identities. What is that about? So I speak for myself was written by two Muslim Females, uh, one of them who actually is um, working for CNN, and uh, they asked me to participate and be one of the contributor contributors to this book. They wanted to portray Muslim women uh, in a positive light as opposed to the typical stereotype and misconceptions that the, mm -hmm. the you know, general public actually has. So... This is a, a book of 40 women under the age of 40, born and raised in the United States, but born as Muslim. Actually, there, there are, uh, I think, uh, a couple of contributors in the book that were Muslim converts. Okay. So dual identities just basically was about the cultural conflict of growing up as a Muslim. Now, I was not raised in Chicago. I wasn't fortunate enough to have a good large community as a support system. I grew up in, in Louisiana, New Orleans. So at the time when I was growing up, it was fairly new for, for Muslim or Arab families to, to be there. As a matter of fact, my family was one of the very first to uh, move and, and establish a life in New Orleans, Louisiana. We didn't really have any mosques. We didn't have any support systems like there are here in, in Chicago. And then I ended up living in Florida. My family lived in Florida. So um, Dual, dual identities was basically about my own personal experience growing up with the conflict of my religion and also finally finding a way to bridge the gap between the conflict that I had. I had an inner conflict inside of me and so um, you know, it's hard when you're a Muslim girl growing up in a traditional household and you don't have a support system mm -hmm. that we do here in Chicago, in the Chicagoland area. So that's basically what my chapter was about and how I was able to overcome that 
be proud of who I am and being a Muslim Arab woman and to be able to overcome some of the stereotypes and the misconceptions and uh, finally attaining what every other woman wants and that's finally happiness and also becoming a career woman and being an attorney and, and you were able to do all of that and practice your religion and be proud of who you're, you are. And I really want to focus on that. Now, I know you're a mother of three mm -hmm. beautiful children. Yes, thank you. And you also are an attorney, of course. How is that balance made? Is it possible to have a crazy lifestyle in your career and then also come home to children? Well, as with any working mother and with any type of career, I think that it, first of all, it's, it is not easy. Second of all, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of dedication and focus, and a lot of relying on help from your family and friends and neighbors. So I really did take advantage of utilizing my, my support that was around me, and I don't think I could ever do that without any of my friends or my neighbors or family. I think it's very important to take advantage and, and use the resources that are available out there for you. So it doesn't come easy. It requires a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication. But at some point, you know, things start to get smooth once you have a system in place. So mm -hmm. I have a system going on right now that's actually <laughs> working. We'll see how long that, you know, you know, we have our ups and downs. But in the end, it's rewarding, and I think it has a positive effect on my children. Mm -hmm. When they see how hard I work to to help make a difference and impact people's lives, you know, it helps my children also. It helps shape them as individuals. So and I think that that's an achievement on its own, that you're able to actually balance that and achieve a career as well as a household and raise children. Other achievements. In 2008, you were nominated as a delegate for the Democratic National Convention to represent the 13th Congressional District, and that was by President Barack Obama. Yes. How was that experience like? Well, that was a, lo a lot of fun, actually. Uh, holding a, a position as a delegate or being nominated as a delegate is actually an official political office. That was much to my surprise, but uh, it was a great experience. I ended up... I, having that nomination through volunteering on President Obama's campaign when he was running for senator. Mm -hmm. So I was able to meet a lot of people and network and uh, one of my friends actually recommended me and that's I got nominated and my name actually appeared on the ballot so I was mm -hmm. surprised when I went down to go vote. Uh, so it, it was a really great experience. It was very fun. And you were also appointed as a special assistant attorney general for the state of Illinois. What yeah. was your position there exactly? So right after law school, I worked for a large firm, and the owner of that firm is now Alderman, Alderman Bob Fioretti. And uh, special assistant attorney general was a position that I held during my uh, employment with that firm. So I was representing the state of Illinois in what's called condemnation or eminent domain law. So I would actually represent the state of Illinois when the state of Illinois needed to acquire land or property from private individuals in order for them to enhance public roads or highways. Mm -hmm. So that was my, my position with them. Reem, we're going to take a short commercial break and we'll be back for more and we'll definitely cover much more with Reem Hoda. I think that he's a, a very nice guy, tough guy, very good family man. I've seen him with his children, and he's, I've seen how his family comes first and foremost, and that's probably why he's not being very polished on the news. Well, as of now, there is really no case. It's just an investigation because there haven't been any charges, and we feel confident that uh, Mr. Peterson will not be charged. As of now, the only progress that's been on the case is that the law enforcement has stopped searching for Stacey Peterson. The media hysteria has also kind of calmed down a little bit so that the children can 
go on and maybe have a nice holiday vacation. And As far as how he's dealing with the holiday, he's basically trying to just let his children have as much of a normal life as any other children. Well, right now we're just satisfied that the search right now, um, it, it's halted, so um, we're just satisfied right now that we've been able to mitigate a lot of the rumors and innuendo and basically try to filter all of the gossip down to just bare facts. And we don't expect any charges to be made against Mr. Peterson, and we hope that the search for Stacy will continue, however. And we're back on Imprints on Yehela Voice, and you're listening to us on our main website, www.yehelavoice.com. You could text us your questions and comments to 708-321-1313, or drop us a line on our Facebook page, Yehela Voice. And the clip you just heard is attorney Reem Hoda speaking on behalf of Drew Peterson. Reem, the Drew Peterson case, this is one for the books. Everyone was talking about this, and you were on the defense. Given that you knew the counts against Drew, what enticed you to be a part of the case? Well, first of all, I think, you know, every person is assumed, presumed innocent until found guilty, and every person has a right to an attorney and a right to a defense. So it, the, the case was very interesting. It had a lot of complex legal issues. Uh, it was a very high-profile case. The case actually was in Will County, so it wasn't too far from where I lived. I also live in Will County. Uh, so I thought, you know, it was very interesting to, to be a part of it. There was a lot of famous attorneys that I met, a lot of people in the media that I was able to become friends with, and it not only gained national recognition, but it was also uh, a case that uh, was recognized all over the world. So, and could you give an overview for our listeners if they don't know about the case already? Sure. So, Drew Peterson is the former police officer from Bolingbrook, and he had been charged with the murder of his wife Kathleen. At the same time, his fourth wife, Stacy Peterson, was missing and uh, remains to this point missing and uh, he was charged with murder after a few years of after Kathleen Savio's death immediately the the state uh, d pretty much dismissed the case as uh, an accidental drowning in the bathtub mm -hmm. it wasn't until Stacy Peterson ended up going missing that triggered an investigation into Kathleen Savio's death and then she was actually exhumed her body was exhumed and the investigation did go on for quite some time eventually at some point Drew Peterson was charged with the murder of Kathleen Savio and you dropped out of the case why well I, I withdrew from the case and it had nothing to do with whether or not I believed in the, it had nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of Drew Peterson. Obviously, I withdrew from the case because I ended up I ended my partnership with my former law partner and terminated that. So I didn't think that it would actually be practical, nor would it be uh, in anybody's benefit for me to continue working on handling the same case that he was involved in. So it was a very contentious partnership breakup and. I thought that it would be in the client's best interest for me to withdraw. Now, there was a lot of controversy with the reason why you left the uh, firm. Would you like to clear that up a bit? Uh, well, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know there <laughs> have been rumors or there have been you know different opinions, but the reason I left the firm is just because I wanted to start my own practice. I did not want to have a partner and I wanted to move forward and uh, I had different interests so I thought that would be time-wise I thought that would be uh, 
ideal for me to move out and start my own practice. But obviously, with something as big as a case such as the Drew Peterson murder mm -hmm. case and the trial going on, you know, there was a lot of speculation, but it was really that I you know, just wanted to try new things and start my own practice. And Reem, although those were negative sides to the case, there was a pro. You and the defense for the case filed a motion to have the new Illinois hearsay law, nicknamed Drew's Law, declared unconstitutional. That's a huge step. That's making a legal change. Tell us about that. Sure. So throughout the Drew Peterson case, the basically the main highlight or the main uh, controversy was uh, regarding the evidence that the state had acquired to bring charges against Drew Peterson, and that was the hearsay law. So throughout the trial and throughout the uh, litigation, the progress of this case, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court held that and declared that the that law that was being used against Drew Peterson, that the state actually named the uh, Drew law, was unconstitutional. So, you know, that was something that my name is uh, on, and uh, hopefully. Um, will be able to educate a lot of new lawyers and provide uh, a lot of assistance um, whenever somebody's faced with uh, these issues. And also the Drew Peterson Exposed mm -hmm. book came after the case as well. And in the book, Drew Peterson Exposed, it indicates more information about the case and how you handle the DCFS claim. What happened? Well, Obviously, as an attorney, even though I'm, I no longer represent the client, I still am you know, bound to attorney-client privilege, so I am really not able to divulge any information regarding uh, any communication that I had with my client. Mm -hmm. But I can say, because this is public knowledge and it was actually in a book, that I did at some point have to represent him in some investigation that involved uh, the well-being of the minor children that were living at home and that was initially in the beginning of the investigation before Drew Peterson was charged with murder. Reem, we're going to talk about your new firm and your goals with that firm. But we're going to be right back. Again, you are listening to Imprint on Yehla Voice on our main website, www.yehlavoice.com. The number at the studio, 708-321-1313. Make sure to text us your comments and or questions. And also on Facebook at Yehla Voice. We'll be right back. Listen to the radio. Listen to Yehla Voice. Just a reminder, Mohamed Asaf and Ziad Khouri are going to be at the Carlisle in Chicago on Friday, May 16th. And you have a chance to win tickets and backstage passes from Yehla Voice. All you have to do is text us to 708-321-1313 with your name and your email to be placed in the drawing. And of course, we're back on the show Imprints on Yehla Voice with attorney Reem Oda. Reem, thank you for being back with us. Thank you. You opened up your own law firm. It's called the Law Offices of Reem Oda, which includes both international and local cases. What's the goal with your firm? So basically, my firm is actually uh, comprised of many different attorneys that have their own sole practice. We all work together as one big network. My own practice focuses on criminal defense, immigration defense, family law. And then my colleagues handle the personal injury, workman's compensation cases, medical malpractice. And I have associates that work with me as well. And uh, we handle just a, a variety of different uh, legal issues. What, what else are you working on as of right now? Well, that's a, that's a broad question. I'm working on what am I not working on. I'm handling <laughs> currently hundreds of cases. But right now what seems to be... Uh, I guess the priority are a lot of the political asylum cases, especially for the Syrian community mm -hmm. and the Syrian immigrants here. So 
because of the uh, you know, civil war that's going on right now, that's that's keeping me very busy. And I'm representing individuals from you know all professions and in different states. So we actually travel to different states handling asylum cases. Some of those cases, most of them, unfortunately, have been approved right away. Some of them do, on rare occasion, get transferred uh, to immigration court. Mm-hmm. I'm handling a lot of different felony cases. Um, Will County, Cook County, DuPage County. Um, another area that I'm handling, I am also licensed um, in the federal court, so I'm okay. a federal trial attorney as well, but I handle a lot of the federal mandamus cases, and those are primarily where I sue the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, um, I sue the director of the FBI, uh, director of, it depends also on what type of case, but primarily I have been very busy with that and that's you know that's a federal case a lot of people are not aware of and that it's a very long story and there's really no reason to it but uh, a lot of individuals do not understand some of their rights but after 9-11 we have uh, a, a lot of our people in our community that have not had their applications petitions or cases adjudicated mm-hmm. there's a reason for that and that stems out of 9-11 and if you're not getting a response from the government, then you should hire an attorney. You have a right in federal court, and you can sue the government. It's, it, you know, it's not something that the people have to be afraid of. You can actually have your attorney do that, and uh, you don't even have to go to court. And usually within a month or two, you do get some sort of answers. Now, everyone that is interested in law ends up being an attorney. Not everyone. I would say many people. Many. Now, your goal in the future, is it to remain an attorney? Do you have any other future plans? Well, I'm currently working on my own autobiography. So I'm working on writing a book. I think, you know, that's in the works. I think mm-hmm. I need about another year. I have a co-author who is working with me, and she's 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 wonderful. So that's aside from that. I don't know if I'm going to be doing anything besides being an attorney <laughs> right now. I don't know if I, I can or if I actually want to. You know, it's very hard work and long hours. And you're very passionate about it as well. I'm passionate about it. And um, I, I know, I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. But maybe one day I'll run for judge. <laughs> well, we wish you the best of luck, Reem. Thank you. Before we let you go... Please let our listeners know how they may contact you, maybe via your website or phone number at the office. Sure. So my website is www.odeylaw.com. That's www.odehlaw.com. My office number is 312-739-1000. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on Avo. I'm on some other social media. So there's always a way to find me. (laughs) Well, it was a pleasure having you you with us, Reem. Once, Thank you, Nassim. Once more, we were with attorney and Arab American advocate Reem Hada. The Hala Voice, the Arab Voice in America. In America.